Hello and welcome to the Tulsa Times podcast. I'm Patrick McNicholas, the artist and researcher behind Time Travel Tulsa. And as always, I'm joined with local historian and friend John Beasley. In this show, we discuss Tulsa's past, present, and future. So sit back and relax as we talk Tulsa Times. Thanks for joining us for this second episode of the Tulsa Times podcast. We haven't been asked to stop yet by anyone. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, this is Patrick here, Patrick Nicholas, Time Travel Tulsa. And I'm John Beasley. And of course, we want to thank everyone who has listened thus far. We have really some great reaction feedback from the first episode, A, a lot more plays than the few that I expected from my parents. And um, in this episode, they're going to love this one. We're going to dig a little bit deeper than usual on our main topic. Much, much deeper, pun intended. Yeah, indeed. Um, But always we'll start with the recent happenings and latest developments. And of course, this page was created, or the podcast was created, uh, due to the page, the Time Travel Tulsa Project, And one of those new posts that was in Tulsa People, the Robinson Hotel. So Robinson's investment in to build that hotel coincided with the Glenpool oil boom, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And it really became, you know, the hotel was kind of where a lot of the oil men would stay when they were, you know, the oil fields even being miles away. Million dollar deals done in that lobby. And the... Uh, the alcove of the building is where the palm garden was. And so when I was researching this, you know, it was garden and then I heard rooftop garden and I was like, rooftops, obviously rooftop. And so the more I looked into it, I was able to find actually the, the note that said it was opened in 1907 with fireworks being blown off. But this is where they would do concerts, um, vaudevillian performances, and in early motion pictures. All that on the roof. Up until midnight. Wow, fantastic. And and, uh, there there was very little evidence kind of in the general history. And, of course, we lost the building, so it's not on the National Register. So, you know, for some people, and, and for me, you know, the newspaper's resource has really um, brought to light a whole lot of things that maybe, you know, certain historians in the past just kind of didn't feel like mentioning. And so I kind of feel like, you know, it's helped me kind of elaborate a little bit more on some of the the condensed versions of these stories. It is, yeah. You, you get, uh, you know, and, and, and you are uh, prone to, what is it falling down the rabbit hole? Um, mm-hmm. Because uh, yeah, you've got uh, access to some uh, some great material, and um, yeah, I think a lot of the things that you come up with, nobody else has seen those documents in you know ninety years. So uh, yeah, you've got or some great just resources, not- and to be able to take that time and that mm-hmm. dedication and that focus, because it is a lot to sift through. And I really appreciate your work uh, in so many ways, because I do recognize how much time you put into these um, write ups that you do for you know Robinson Hotel. I just love the uh, the pictures. But another. Tulsa People article was the first Christian church, which was, of course, used in UHF, your favorite movie. Yes, Weird Al. And uh, do you remember the first time that you heard Weird Al? Uh, Let's see, I would have been uh, a teenager, so uh, probably Eat It. Uh, was I think that was his first uh, big hit, The Michael Jackson cover. Yes, 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 yes. So for those aware... Or unaware of Weird Al, he is a... Wait, wait, there are people that are unaware of Weird Al? I think Al. so, I think so. Um, <sighs> I remember... So we need I to was do an unaware. episode, apparently. <laughs> we need him educated. on it, too. So if you're listening, uh, Al, be sure to reach out to us. Uh, but I remember hearing him as a teenager myself. Of course, he had been around for multiple years, but not on my radar by right. any means. <laughs> um, I remember hearing Amish paradise ah yes um the cover or well, i guess they're all covers but true it was free wheel which is a bike across the state um known by uh the few that are willing and crazy enough to bike across the state in a week but uh, in the middle of summer but i was a part of that and i remember um you know listening to almish paradise and just being kind of confused like this there you was go. popular, yes. but it, it was, was very it's... clever. And I mean, that's Indeed. how all of it is. So 
I remember moving to Tulsa That's and then Coolio finding Leo song, yeah, right? Yeah, and I remember moving to Tulsa and finding out that he had filmed a movie here, which I was completely unaware of. But you, you were, you had just left, so you weren't around. I did, the- yeah, yeah. I was uh, down at I was down in Norman, University of Oklahoma, when that was being filmed. Uh, I, I know some people that were involved in the wheel of fish. Uh, scene so Mm -hmm. you know it's amazing in fact one of them we met on an outsiders tour because you know we have mentioned UHF Mm -hmm. when we gave the uh, the locations tours for outsiders and yeah there was a lady there that was like oh hey I was uh, in that scene wheel of fish (laughs) if you don't know wheel of fish uh, you should definitely check out uh, the 1989 movie UHF filmed entirely here in Tulsa I think a few people were aware of the wheel of at least internet wise because it was a lot of dead fish and the smell that day supposedly was so there's a there's a lot of history of just that movie alone and we're lucky that uh it was filmed here in Tulsa and and the fact that I was able to kind of finesse it into this article but one that's going to be coming up in the next Tulsa people is some telephone history which I learned a lot I mean I, I knew certain things but I really had to do my research just to figure out a little bit about the telephone history, but mainly the post is about the Southwestern Bell building there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There, uh, um, that is a fantastic building. It's a, a Tudor revival. It's something that they did with uh, many of their buildings of that era. We see a very similar uh, Southwestern Bell building in Sepulpa's downtown. And uh, not too far from where that building is, is 4th in Boston, which is the post that we were working on this week. Oh, yes. The uh, YouTube video that uh, I'm going to drop same time that we drop this uh, this podcast. And yeah, there was another. That was the Pioneer Telephone Building that sat on that corner, uh, the southwest corner of 4th and Boston, where the Boston Building, the new Hyatt Place is currently. But you also had some other videos as well. The Riverview Snow, which we're going to mention a little bit about the weather. And Uh, the Route 66. I mean, it feels like we just did this podcast, but it's been a month. So you've done some things uh, with the videos yourself. It has been, yep. The YouTube channel is called Tulsa Beasley. A real short one just, you know, to get some footage of Riverview, my neighborhood in the snow. And then just, you know, because I needed a February feature episode that was, is uh, fourth in Boston. Thank you for helping me out with that one. Looking forward to next month's uh, episode, which will be the Blue Dome District. And I have a post about that, so I'm looking forward to working with that. And we've also announced our guest for the next episode, episode three, speaking of Route 66 and the Blue Dome. Uh, Reese Martin's going to be on with Big us. Big fan so. of Reese Martin of the uh, Tulsa Route 66 Commission. I've known Reese for uh, for many years, and uh, yeah, he is just a uh, a great guy, so knowledgeable, and I appreciate all his work and dedication uh, to highlight Route 66 and specifically Route 66 through Tulsa. Yep, and we're going to have him on, and um, we're also. You know, we were given, uh, the both of us, we were given tours for the Will Rogers students at the Outsiders, and we were both featured on TV in late January, so that was kind of cool. And uh, another quick mention, shout out to the Bike Polo League, which I recently joined and uh, have really had some fun, kind of an unusual workout, but I'm kind of sore in places I never have been ever before in my life, but I survived, and uh, (laughs) despite my mom's concern... But uh, the recent announcements in Tulsa, as we always do, big conversations about the center of the universe renovations. And we were just down there and we were talking about how bad a shape and then one person makes a post and it blows up. So, um, you know, we passed a bond issue in 2000. I want to say it was 2016. Maybe it was 2018, but that was included. So, yeah, it has been a frustration that we continue to see no progress. In the meantime, uh, these kids these days, you kids, um, (laughs) you know, stealing those pavers and those bricks. You know, everybody wants a souvenir. And the next thing you know, we got holes all over the center of the universe. I'm anxious to see, um, and I do mean anxious. Anxious. I do have some anxiety over this uh, redevelopment of that area because 
you know, I don't want to lose that, uh, whatever that effect is. Audio effect that creates the center of the universe, but also the uh, unique artwork that's down there that's caused a lot of conspiracy theories and and beyond ah the artificial cloud <laughs> yes indeed the artificial with the uh, planes falling from the sky yeah hmm. uh we hope to see that the center universe is renovated in the way that tolson's would appreciate but uh, one thing that tolson's didn't appreciate was the earthquake uh, on the morning of january 31st this is what i've heard I don't know what time it was. I, I forgot to write that down, but it was pretty, I mean, 9, 10, 11, somewhere, somewhere in the morning. I just remember looking at the um, post and it was one after the other. But Indeed, me the too. Fun, That's how I found out because I didn't feel anything. The fun fact about um, the earthquake, or you know, at least the picking up the, the waves, is that the Oklahoma Geological Survey is located in Leonard, just south of Tulsa. So if you take Memorial out of town, I don't suggest taking it now because it's all in construction. But Leonard, just south of town, is where they do those uh, records of the the quakes and whatnot. But other kind of uh, environmental factors, you know, it was 70 degrees, and then we had six inches of snow one night. And so... um, I had a time lapse going to that, but then the batteries died. So the melt was actually more impressive, which took about three days than the actual snowfall in itself. But reminiscent of last year this time, but less, less, much less. Oh, yeah. Last February was brutal. And uh, what was crazy, I was watching the news and there was a snowmobile, some guy driving a snowmobile on 131st Street. Wait, wait, what? (laughs) Somebody in Tulsa owns a snowmobile okay i suppose if you, you i mean know, there's haul a lot it of, up to colorado there's a lot of colorado people but, moving okay. here fair and enough fair enough he was going to the dispensary i think or something but, <laughs> <laughs> and right. it makes it meant to run some errands i wouldn't say the this the front of it was very large but you know like the windshield but you know, it was on TV, so there's evidence of it. Snowmobiles in Tulsa. And skiing in Tulsa. Skiing oh, in yes. Reservoir Hill. Residents uh, at Reservoir Hill were seen on Facebook and beyond <laughs> hmm, <laughs> skiing the yes. quote-unquote Tulsa <laughs> Mountains, which <laughs> do Tulsa exist Mountains. and have exist. And we'll get more into that in detail, but obviously the Tulsa Mountains was a fun thing that KRMG did. Yes, John um, Erling. <laughs> yeah, in the past. So uh, feel free to, to jump into that research. That's fun. There's some great audio clips. Um, but uh, the Hard Weldon Mansion, a popular sledding spot on the different type of um, snow aspect, they put a fence up around it, and, and it they looked like they were... Putting a fence up. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately for a lot of sledders, that well, you know that that one fence of has been actually planned for a while. I um, you know, and I'm not a huge fan of the fence, and we'll see what they ultimately do. I really like how uh, the McBurney Mansion they used vegetation, so it is now. You know, you can say that lawn is kind of fenced off. It certainly has a boundary to it, but instead of a fence Mm -hmm. it is all vegetation but you know um yeah that's certainly a liability coming off of harwell in there you know and just think you know the tragedy that occurred over in broken arrow with kids sliding down uh these hills and ending up in the road you know you slide down harwell and then somehow end up in riverside drive and things can get uh rough so um yeah yeah i i i don't like the uh the fence you know i like the open view from the lawn right on to uh riverside drive but i certainly certainly understand the reasons for doing so yeah and um and earlier today it snowed not enough for sledding or skiing but a huge storm woke me up in the middle of the night and then i saw the sun coming through the window so it was an ordinary oklahoma day here in february um, uh, right because it was 68 degrees yesterday i mean mm-hmm. i was out with miss jody my dog um we were out uh last night probably 8 39 o'clock and it was just beautiful we woke up this morning and it's frigid extremely frigid yeah and, tulsa uh, weather the um unfortunately another thing another 
kind of establishment that's been in Tulsa, especially in that area. The Burnco Barbecue had um, burnt down, unfortunately, overnight. Yes, that, uh, wow, wow, tragic. And a lot of people, you know, it's uh, one of those things, uh, uh, yeah, I saw a lot of people commenting commenting on it, and that, that building itself, not only Burnco, you know, uh, possibly the best barbecue in Tulsa, I would certainly agree with that, but just that building alone has been, you know, through the years, many different things, and so it's been interesting um, to hear everybody and read everybody's memories, you know, whether we talk about when, uh, when our friend Donnie Rich opened it up back in what the 90s is steamroller blues and barbecue they had music it was a music venue before uh jj kale leon russell um i think bonnie Raitt had performed in wow. that uh spot at one point when she was hanging out with leon at uh, shelter records and a popular spot for i know there were grocery stores in the area going back you know way before it was the entertainment district that it is today but um you know, we lost one thing, but we did find some things, and uh, that was bricks that were unearthed during the construction that's happening along Martin Luther King Boulevard um, or Avenue, um, it, which is Cincinnati Avenue on the other side of the railroad tracks. But uh, we were aware of it by Mike Lenz, a past co-worker of mine at KOTV, who it's, that road is right next to the KOTV studios and building. And uh, you said there were three different types of bricks that were unearthed because you ended so, up going there. Well, no, in that spot, there was the Coffeeville, um, the mm. bricks that came from Coffeeville. But there are a few other bricks in that area. And so you can see on, say, a few blocks west of there on North Cheyenne, you know, uh, those bricks are still exposed at the surface, but they didn't even know that there were bricks there on MLK. So, you know, there are layers. So the, the original roadbed, those uh, pavers, those brick pavers were left. They just put concrete on top of it. Then they put asphalt on top of it. And there have been so many different layers over the decades that the, uh, the contractors were very surprised as they were digging out this roadbed to find those bricks from, what was that, 1908, that those uh, bricks were laid down on uh, North Cincinnati, now MLK? Well, not only that, but there were also probably, I mean, and you can see this right next to the Guthrie Green, but railroad tracks that are probably underneath the road as well. And uh, those are uh, exposed right there on the west side of the Guthrie Green. But yeah, the, the 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 bricks that are in the district go back until the early 1900s. And uh, you know, street paving was 1908, but the city ordinance in Tulsa at the time was that you had to mandate paved sidewalks for people to you know visit locations. 1903. But uh, Cheyenne's one of those great examples, um, although you don't see the markings that you see on the ones that you got, you know. Yeah, um, the ones that I got, unfortunately, were not the Tulsa bricks. These bricks came from Coffeeville, but that was on the underside. So you still see that flat surface is what was presented. It was on the bottom where it's listed as, in this situation, Coffeeville. I know there are people that have the Tulsa bricks in their collection. Um, and again, that part would be on the bottom mm -hmm. of the paver. Um, but other things that were happening um, within the past month, opening night at the exhibit, uh, Technology and Art with Art House, and that was a great uh, opening night. Uh, it was crazy because they had a QR code that they created that had a dinosaur on it. And after all this dinosaur research that I've been doing, it was kind of ironic to see it um, a part of my exhibit. But um, uh, it's going to be open until February 20th, so be sure to check that out. But the other things that were kind of announced, um, the concrete plan on the west side of the river, they're going to expand or planning to expand River City west festival park which you know they just built a whole lot of um apartments over there as well so they're looking for development on that side of the river now it's more about than, time yeah it's been a while um but then of course more development downtown despite um people moving around the qt uh which was there was an old what quick trip uh, there was an downtown. old quick trip yeah they're uh you know uh off of maine and fourth i believe 
Yeah, I don't remember that myself, but I will remember the QT eatery that's in the BOK, and it looks like they've been, you know, um, improving that uh, general area. And the other big news that everybody keeps mentioning is the Tulsa King, not the um, Tiger King, but the Tulsa King, <laughs> starring Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> it's a mobster series, so who knows? What to expect with this, but for for movie people or series people, I guess, they're going to be pleased with that. I know that's going to be inaccurate, and we'll probably have plenty to talk about <laughs> there we go. on yes. here, so it helps sure. us, I guess. But other filming news, of course, um, the Old Park Elementary School in the Red Fork, closed in 2017, is going to be used as a office and storage space, and even... Um, include broadcast students to check out this area for the res dogs reservation dogs season two so it's going to be kind of like a headquarters for them a lot of us are really excited sterling is my favorite tulson tulson of the year for uh 2021 sterling harjo and yeah so glad to have a uh, reservation dogs uh filmed here in part of it filmed here in tulsa and yeah that um Webster High School, you know, that's part of their uh, their magnet program is broadcasting. And so it's great not only that they have that facility that they can use specifically for their film and broadcasting, but to have Sterling Harjo then come into that space. And so I'm sure that he will interact well with those students. And, and I'm excited for the students there at uh, Webster High. Absolutely. And, of course, as we mentioned earlier, um, the guest and topic for the next episode, Reese Martin, Route 66 Commission. So look forward to that. But now, drum roll, please, we're going to jump into the main subject, which is kind of a conglomeration of information. But um, we um, hope you guys find kind of what we found here interesting, and uh, we're glad to share what we have found. So just like the last episode, and we recapped the past year, this is actually going to be impossible to mention everything because we're recapping kind of like eternity um (laughs) you're gonna start uh, once again you (laughs) fell down the rabbit hole didn't you patrick i went a little Um, too far 1.4 billion years (laughs) back is that right the history of tulsa over 1.4 billion years. so the 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 point of this episode was to kind of conceptualize how tulsa became what it is but you know there's more history in the more recent times and in more forgotten history that we keep finding And so this is kind of a a conceptualized timeline of Tulsa in the area that it became. So, yeah, the oldest rocks, 1.4 billion years, which would have been volcanic rock that lifted above the ocean for the first time. And, you know, uh, over 550 million years ago, the shallow sea would return to the area, bringing new and advanced types of like aquatic life, not the ones that we see in, in fossils yet, but most of the geological significant time in Tulsa would have been between 280 and 340 million years ago. So, so that's, yeah, you're talking Permian, and which is significant to Tulsa because Tulsa is based on oil. That's how we became who we were. So certainly those Permian formations of the hundreds of millions of years ago are significant to Tulsa. And like I mentioned, the Tulsa Mountains. So, you know, there were actually mountains in Tulsa that rivaled the Rockies. And according to the research, they actually rose and fell at least twice, you know, being eroded and and so on. But during this, uh, you know, invasion of the sea, these uh, minerals, materials of life kind of fell into these basins, as they're called now, and created kind of like these swampy areas and that's kind of where you know our state's petroleum reserves were formed and coal beds as well and and i'm going to mention mines in greater detail as we come up but you know most of these deposits are sedimentary rock about 300 million years ago but the reserves can be much older up to 500 million and it's ancient algae bacteria and plants that create this fossil fuel like i was saying but also intense heat and pressure that create 
hydrogen and carbon right to create hydrocarbons so they're just uh carbohydrates you know i mean that's what plants do they put carbohydrates together we just you know in a different formation it's still those same hydrogen carbon oxygen atoms that were put together by those plants primarily algae um and then over billions of years of pressure we have hydrocarbons and fossil fuels but you know, we didn't always know. I mean, we've known more in recent times because, I mean, you know, the Sinclair logo was a dinosaur. Oh, indeed. And so, you know. And we did have dinosaurs here as well. But, yeah, that's not the source of the fossil fuels that we use. But the most of the actual true fossils and not the fossil fuels come from around this period of time, around 300 million years ago, which plants aquatic life, coral, which I'm very familiar with living on Lake Eufaula. I see a lot of what looked like petrified wood, but were actually kind of, you know, coral type things that I learned to find out. But even sharks um, later in time and everything. But in more recent times, 200 million years ago, uh, we were on the shoreline and that's where we would have seen dwelling dinosaurs and other reptiles that likely roamed the area, um, including the state um dinosaur but that those fossils a lot of those you know in our area tulsa were you know destroyed due to the rising and lowering of water that but it helped preserved other parts of our fossil history just not everything what we find around here are primarily those marine deposits like uh you're talking about the crinoid fossils the stems of those uh they were very much coral like while your vertebrate dinosaurs like our state dinosaur uh, something asaurus. It, uh, I'm drawing a blank on it at the moment. But those are primarily found in western Oklahoma. I did uh, find a fossil myself. It's been a few years out in the the Panhandle. They have this really interesting. This shale is green in color. It. I mean, you can see where these fossil beds are just as you're driving. You know, down 412 through the Panhandle. I had a little piece of a fossilized fern from say 65 70 million years ago that you can find out in the uh, panhandle yeah i mean and my dad you know uh lake ufala was put in there and i mean of course they moved into that area um thanks to uh, my grandpa doing wild catting of coal in that area but there were i mean he's got a whole wall of fossils that were from this coral type time period so by, you know, 150 million years ago, that's when Oklahoma would have been above sea level. And that's when, when the Triassic and Jurassic times, as a lot of people know from the famous movie. Yes, Jurassic when Park. dinosaurs roamed Oklahoma. You know, we actually have a uh, state dinosaur. <laughs> we have state wow. emblems for everything. And in 2006, the Oklahoma legislature actually named a state dinosaur dinosaur it was the archanthosaurus uh which is found in uh, uh southeast oklahoma but not only do we have a state dinosaur we actually have a dinosaur as our state fossil the um sorophagonax maximus the lord of the lizard eaters and they were both, you know, T-Rex, and they would have, you know, been around 125 million years ago and, and kind of would have been, again, lord of everything at the time because bigger than a T-Rex, just basically having your way. Uh, the state dinosaur was known as the high-spined lizard, so, I mean, he didn't really have a whole lot of people trying to come at him either, you know. But they're both theropods and, and, and obviously, you know, part of that T-Rex type family. But many types of fossils have been found in Oklahoma that shows that it was teeming of prehistoric life for millions of years. And I encourage you to check out uh, Oklahoma fossil dinosaur history. And again, trilobites. Trilobites are very common in southern Oklahoma. You mentioned those crinoid fossils that we find commonly around here in the Tulsa area. And, and always interesting for multiple generations of people, you know, of all ages. But unfortunately, we did lose those. Um. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here in Tulsa without the uh, 
without the Lord of the Lizard Eaters. Yeah, is that what you called well, him? Well, I guess so. you're right. I, um, <laughs> yeah, the unfortunate event 65 million years ago. Um, the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. Changed our neighborhood a little bit. But um, the continent kept changing and eventually became favorable for the Great Plains about 25 million years ago. But it was only within the past, you know, 2 million to 50,000 years that we see that the plains were traveled by mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, prehistoric camels, horses, and even armadillos that we see today. I saw one in the backyard last year. Um, but just mammal type animals, you know, the, the age of the mammals, as they as they say, it would have been around this time that we see our first humans inhabit the area alongside these creatures. It's really tough to determine, you know, how long humans have been in this area, because um, as, you know, largely nomadic people, um, you know, we don't know. Uh, 30,000 is kind of uh, the, the estimate. But, you know, outside of, say, the mound builders, you know, so when that Mississippian culture was in this area, uh, spiral mounds, something that people are very familiar with, there we actually, you know, had tangible evidence of you know human impact on the environment other than that we really don't know exactly how long modern man has been in what is now northeast oklahoma yeah i mean there 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 is some evidence you know from the bison herds and mammoths that were you know used and weapons that were used to kind of um use these to eat um, but the mammoth would eventually go extinct, you know, around 13,000 years ago. And that's when we had other types of cultures that were becoming more uh, resourceful and using the environment even more. But it's interesting to think um, 10,000 years ago, the environment in eastern Oklahoma was very much like it is today. So 10,000 years, um, the environment hasn't changed much and the best collection of those materials do belong to Gilcrease so unfortunately we don't have those accessible but if you are interested in uh, the human impact uh, the human history in Northeast Oklahoma. Looking forward to um, the new displays that they're going to have focused specifically on that topic at the new Gilcrease whenever it opens up in 2020, whatever. We're looking forward to it. And um, what was interesting when I was doing this research, they the hunters and gatherers have been kind of renamed the hunters and collectors, which I... I mean, I assume it's basically the same thing, but I just noticed, you know, I kept seeing collectors over and over, and it made sense, you know, I mean, there was a great change in, in religion, they started burying their own um, dead, different types of rituals, but also increased and advanced weapons, tools for processing the animals and plants around them, and even fashion, you know, wearing these shells that we see and we find, um, you know, but these people were always looking for rock and mineral resources to create all types of things, you know, art, tools, different types of medicine with bones crushed up. Um, but it's interesting also to think about the Arkansas River, you know, 5,000 years ago would have likely been formed um, in this area or general area. But of course, you know, a river has a different path over that period of time but you know it have been an ice age and lots of melting and glaciers which led to the great plains you know farming agriculture the mississippian culture which also different types of textiles artwork and of course as we mentioned the spiral mounds and then later plains indians would utilize oil springs and actually consider them kind of healing waters by those who drank and soaked in the water and that water was collected and, and touted kind of as a cure-all and uh, what was interesting later the five tribes who were you know obviously removed here uh, created commercial areas and spas that they considered oil springs and, and there's a town even called medicine springs in oklahoma but um so lots of change, of course, and, you know, the biggest change would be the Europeans arriving mid-16th century. Uh, Francis D. Coronado claims the area for Spain initially, even though he wasn't in the Tulsa area, he was really on the far western side of Oklahoma. 
But that's where we find our first types of miners. You know, the Spanish were in Oklahoma. And uh, shortly thereafter, that's when the French were in the area and they established a, a pretty profitable fur trade up until the point where French lost the area. But the Arkansas River, again, named after or named by the French explorers Arkansas in 1673. So that was actually, you know, you had a lot of people going through this land, but they weren't literate enough to make notes and, and keep this kind of information. Sure, it was that, uh, you know, journeys of uh, Coronado, etc. throughout the late 1600s is the first documents that we have, you know, to show what the area was like and talking about the peoples that were here and what this uh, area was like 400, you know, 50 years ago. And the Spanish called the Arkansas River the Napaste, even a little bit earlier. So I'm not sure where that comes from, but that's what um, the history states. But um, also, um, by 1803, that's when the Louisiana Purchase and the French and Indian War had just ended um, at the turn of the century there. But the U.S. pays $15 million for the Louisiana Purchase, which you can purchase a building downtown Tulsa for probably $15 million now. Um, but, I know of one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know of one, too. Yeah, it's that Bank of Commerce yeah. building that we keep talking about. <laughs> But fifteen million. So this would have been eighteen oh three. They continue their expansion west, which was the main goal for the United States at the time. Yeah, there was a Lewis and Clark exploration. Even though they didn't come through Oklahoma, they did uh, cross over both the Verdigris and Arkansas rivers on their travels, just north of here. The Verdigris, as some people also say, is named by the French uh, fur trappers that were coming through the area. Um, but of course, you know, eventually that Louisiana purchase became in total 15 states, you know, in partial land and in whole land for some of those, including Oklahoma. That's when we became part of the United States. And eventually, uh, you know, I think the first official settlement or, or federal settlement here was, uh, 1824. So, you know, just, uh, less than 20 years after Lewis and Clark was when Fort Gibson was established at the time that Fort Gibson was established again, 1824. So we think about uh, Oklahoma being a relatively young state. What are we? Uh, we're going to celebrate our 115th year of statehood uh, in November of this year. But uh, really, the state has had a presence of um, uh, in America for a long time. In 1824, you know, we were less than 50 years removed from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So 1824 was when uh, Fort Gibson was established on the Arkansas River. And not shortly thereafter is when Washington Irving comes to survey the area. So, yeah, Washington Irving was like the first tourist to visit what is now Oklahoma. Um, Washington Irving, of course, famous early American author, uh, the Rip Van Winkle, uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, among some of his works. And he was also an adventurer and just happened to meet some guys that were coming out here with the uh, Indian Commission to survey this land for removal after the Indian Removal Act of 1830 during the Andrew Jackson administration. But um, what a guy to uh, have document you know, the Tulsa area. This was, again, even before the Lochapoca established their settlement here in the Tulsa area. So he was the first one to document, you know, what was here at that time. He specifically identified the area that we know as McBurney Springs on the grounds of the McBurney Mansion. Um, he specifically mentioned the area where 100 years later in 1932 that they built the monument to Washington Irving there in Owen Park. And, of course, if you want to read Irving's book, it's uh, Tour of the Prairies, which was published in 1835, before those tribes were forcibly removed to our area. But there were tribes that were here already, and, um, you know, a lot of were signing treaties and, and promising a lot of different things. 
So one of the primary missions of that Dragoon expedition that Washington Irving was on was to make contact with the Osage, which they actually failed to do in that initial uh, expedition. But the Osage were in this area before the Trail of Tears, before the Creek and the Cherokee were moved into this area. And in fact, one of the primary missions of Fort Gibson was to maintain the peace because Cherokee people had kind of seen the writing on the wall. There were Cherokee people that were moving into what is now Oklahoma by the 18 teens, you know, long before the 1830 Indian Removal Act. So really the U.S. Army was here to kind of protect those Cherokee because obviously the Osage were not happy about the United States forcing these other people into what had traditionally been their hunting lands. And the Congress reserved in 1828 uh, Oklahoma, or what would become Oklahoma, for Native Americans and told others really to withdraw. But of course, Indian territory at that time was much larger. It reached into Canada, even in Montana, and that's why we have tribes still there today. But the Indian Removal Act was 1830, and the first tribe from the south would have been removed, one of the five tribes, 1831, and that that time period, of course, the forcible removal of tribes lasted until the 1870s. So, I mean, people know of, of the worst period of time, the Trail of Tears. Yeah, 1838, uh, that winter of 1838-39 is when thousands of Cherokee were forced out. And again, during that winter, that's really that Trail of Tears that most people think about, where more than a quarter of those that started did not make it due to being pushed through those harsh conditions without adequate supplies. It was really a shameful period in the history of the United States of America. And, you know, these tribes that were part of the South were very influenced by, um, you know, the colonies and European influence. And so they were kind of more advanced. So they had, you know, even owned slaves and the slaves were a part of this journey um, across multiple states or what would be states to get to where they are. And in 1834, another act created the Indian country, later known as Indian Territory. And that's uh, around the Creek arrival in Tulsa and also the Creek land. Council Oak was kind of the headquarters. Yeah, the Lochapoca had arrived in that time period, 1834 to 1836. In fact, it was 1836 that the Creek Nation decided that what is now Tulsa would be their national headquarters, if you will. Um, they're at the Council Oak Tree before in the 1870s, 1860s or so that the uh, headquarters for the Creek Nation or the Muscogee Nation was moved to Okmulgee. And the name Talisay or uh, I think that's what it is, Tallahassee, maybe, uh, Alabama, which would be known by the creek, uh, Tallahassee, Old Town. And so that's where the name eventually became Tulsi Town and, and Tulsa over time. So there was kind of this evolution of, of naming that originally started in the early 1800s. So it's hard to mention the 1800s without mentioning the Civil War, of course. And we had a Civil War battle, uh, multiple battles in Oklahoma, but Caving Banks, which is the closest to Tulsa in December of 1861. And not I too have been far out to that here. spot. Yeah, yeah. It's um, kind of between Sperry and Skytook as you go up um, Bird Creek is where that battle occurred. There's a there's a horseshoe bend out there, and it's very similar to what uh, it looked like at that time. And this was the case of Creek uh, Native Americans, Muscogee people that were fighting against each other. You know, these tribes were divided as well. We talk about brother versus brother of Americans. Well, it was that case with the Cherokee and the Creek as well. And Chief Yehola was basically getting run out of town. He uh, ended up with his band of uh, Union sympathizing uh, Muscogee Indians, and they ended up all the way up in Kansas being chased out of Oklahoma after that battle of of caving banks and of course there were other battles including honey springs which is the most well-preserved site in oklahoma and not too far from tulsa and from my hometown of shakota 
um, Honey Springs Battlefield. And, you know, not only were there Native Americans on both the Union and Confederate side, Battle of Honey Springs is significant because that saw the first real combat action by black troops. The first Kansas colored infantry fought there at the Battle of Honey Springs. And like you mentioned, you know, the blacks were fighting for their freedom. And at the outbreak of the Civil War, the tribes, the five tribes members owned up to 10,000 slaves. But after the war, Reconstruction Treaties gave them their freedom um, that were owned by these tribal members. And that's when we see the first all-black towns develop in Oklahoma. And there were several all-black towns here in Northeast Oklahoma, including one, Alsuma, was an all-black town that eventually got consumed as the city limits of Tulsa expanded. Alsuma was out by 61st and Garnett, an all-black town here in what is now Tulsa. And uh, by 1896, that's when we see the Daw Commission, the Dawes Commission roles created. And that's basically, you know, plans for allotment. The survey would be followed the next year. But what was interesting about this, uh, former slaves of the tribes also received some acreage as well, which led to even more black towns, including the Greenwood area, which, of course, here in Tulsa is well known. But by 1890, Oklahoma Territory was created in the western portion, and that's where we see, you know, the land run and so on. But it was with that part of the country that Indian Territory was created to create Oklahoma in 1907. Yeah, that Dawes Commission came in in anticipation of statehood because, you know, there was no uh, individual um, property ownership within the Creek or Cherokee Nation. So when the Dawes Commission came to town, it was just to split those up. Um, Again, in anticipation of statehood. One of the interesting things, you know about the Council Oak Tree there at 18th and uh, Cheyenne, And right across the street, just south of the Council Oak Tree, is the James V.C. house. While the the house itself was built in 1913, so much later, James V.C. himself uh, came to Oklahoma from Ohio as a member of that Dawes Commission. And of course, um, following that, 1898 would be the city of Tulsa's officially incorporation yay our birthday and we just came up on 124th as we mentioned in the last episode so the tribal governments of course you know and there's a lot more to the story and we're going to have people that are more qualified to tell this part of the story but the tribal governments were pressured to approve the state constitution Uh, in 1907 and oil becoming one of the driving forces because the 10 years leading to statehood, that's when everything kind of erupted. I mean, uh, Oklahoma became the world's largest oil producer, and that's kind of where we're going to head next is kind of um, how the state became what it is, a combination of events and the fact that we were just in the right place at the right time helped Tulsa become one of the hubs for natural resource transportation and of lifestyle for the you know next 50 years it's uh really the railroad that put tulsa on the map as far as um you know development we talked earlier about the 1830 settlement of the lochapoca band of the muskogee nation but when we think about the american history of tulsa and the modern tulsa it was the uh, frisco railroad that came through here in 1882 interestingly enough um there was some debate on exactly where the railroad would cross the Arkansas River and ultimately was the Creek Nation that offered the better deal, which is why the railroad is where it is. You know, modern Edison Avenue or Edison Street uh, is that dividing line between the Creek and Cherokee Nation here in Tulsa. The Creek offered a better deal, so the Frisco came through uh, the very northern tip of the Creek Nation in 1882, and that's what we know as Tulsa today. 
And, you know, the thing to mention with these railroads, they were operated on coal. And so the first mined coal in the area was done by these railroad companies to to power their trains. And, you know, the Katy entered Oklahoma earlier in 1872 and was focused on coal mining. So that's where we kind of got more interest and more information about the coal mining in Oklahoma. But we're going to go deeper into the mining. We're going to kind of address the elephant in the room, the oil industry, which was for a hundred years before Oklahoma really got in. You know, there were other places in the world, including uh, the United States, where crude was being made into kerosene. And, uh, you know, during that time, they were kind of perfecting this process. But as we mentioned earlier, the first oil seeps were long before European settlers. I mean, these oil springs and medicine springs, again, were cure-alls that gained a commercial appeal by the five tribes. It was the value of oil, and specifically as a fuel, as we saw combustion engines develop, was a big transition because we had, like you mentioned, so much of our energy production was based on coal until this time period when the uh, um, combustion engines and then, of course, the rise of automobiles. And then once we got into World War I and powering the Jeeps, early tanks, you know, that was huge for the city of Tulsa and specifically the development of oil versus the older technology, which was coal. So many wells were being drilled in Oklahoma from the 1860s to the 1890s. The first oil well actually by accident because they were looking for brine to make salt. But it was up in Bartlesville where we get the Nellie Johnstone one that really followed the discoveries that were made in Tulsa. And we had talked about the railroad and their influence on Tulsa. Without the Frisco Railroad building the first bridge across the Arkansas River in 1883, Tulsa would not be what it is because that oil discovered here in the immediate Tulsa area was in the Red Fork, which is west of, and then later along the Glen Pool, which is again on the other side of the river. Without that infrastructure that the Frisco Railroad put in place in the 1880s, Sepulpa would have become the oil capital of the world instead of Tulsa. And to recap those uh, discoveries, Red Fork 1901, known as the Sioux Abe Land, again, Creek Land. Ida Glen number 1, later known as Glen Pool, 1905, also Creek Land, became the largest oil field in the state and also brought pipelines to the area. And it's crazy to think it was only... 1,481 feet below surface when some of these other, you know, wells are much, much deeper. And that goes back into the basin. Significantly deeper. So next door to the Glens, who were, you know, in control of the land lease for the Glen Pool, was Thomas Gilcrease, who became a millionaire in his own right. And uh, in 1917 was receiving royalties for his land leases on 32 wells on his farm. And that's just incredible to think about. And what he left for Tolson's as well. And you yeah, mentioned- that uh, moving from agriculture, because, yeah, when the railroad originally came through, it was to move cattle to these larger markets. We were simply agricultural. Nobody knew about the oil and the significance And, you know, with these earliest oil wells, you know, they had these gushers, which they would celebrate, but you're really losing a lot of oil. So over time, you know, uh, oil had been controlled so that none of these gushers actually happened. But a lot of these photos that we see of these early oil wells, it was kind of like a celebration, you know, but... Uh, they kind of wish they probably would have saved some of that now. The EPA would have a fit. (laughs) They literally dug holes in the ground to store the oil. (laughs) And 
the oil capital of the world, as Tulsa became known, started, you know, in the early 20th century, right after these wells. We had, you know, land leases all over the place, none allowed in city limits today. But we also had the independent refinery, uh, Josh Cosden, who is his own story we would have to save for an episode itself. Indeed. Uh, Josh Cosden uh, built the first large refinery on the west bank of the Arkansas River. 1913 um, was when he completed that refinery. Leading him, it was, again, the largest in North America. He was amongst the wealthiest of all Americans. And uh, boy, did he know how how to uh, spend some money. And for those of you that don't know, uh, refineries are basically when you have the crude, which comes straight from the ground, you need a way to process it. And that's where they're able to split it into multiple gases, including, you know, gas for your car, kerosene, diesel, lubricating, oil, jet fuel, heating oil and other chemicals, you know, create plastics and other type of synthetic fibers. A great educational film that's available on YouTube was retrieved from the Belvedere, the 1957 time capsule that Tulsa made during the Tulsa Rama. Tulsa time. Rama, yes, that's uh, that's going to be worth an episode in and of itself. Again, there's so much deeper that we can delve into uh, each of these. Uh, Cosden being one of my favorite characters, that uh, refinery on the West Side per, um, produced his Diamond brand of gasoline, which later became known as Diamond X, or simply. DX. So a lot of people are familiar with DX oil, especially the outsiders fans among us. But the names, you know, you mentioned Sinclair and their dinosaur mascot. Mm -hmm. Well, Sinclair was here in Tulsa. We're getting ready to see that headquarters building at 5th and Main undergo a historic restoration. Uh, Skelly Phillips, you mentioned Gilcrease, uh, Getty Oil, Texaco, their first headquarter was actually here in Tulsa, despite the name that you might think it, Texas. Uh, Warren, Williams, uh, McFarlane, Chapman, the list goes on and on about the significant oil barons that made their home here in Tulsa during that time period when we were the oil capital of the world. And we were on top of the world and, and making lots of investments, but... Unfortunately, you know, oil was found in other places of the world, in turn, over time, creating a new oil capital. And, you know, we, we had another oil boom in the 80s, which, um, you know, invested in the mid-continent, allowing it to become much larger than it is today, which is a, a caused an ode. But, yes, you know... City Services Building, the... Um, uh, the across from the Mayo Hotel, that brown building. It was also 84, 85 was the time period. Of course, the Williams Tower was a 1976. So yeah, from the uh, mid 70s, once that oil embargo occurred uh, and all of everything going on with OPEC, you know, was really very good for Tulsa in many ways until the 1980s when it all came crashing down. The price of oil fell to less than $10 per barrel, and we were done. But, you know, uh, Tulsa has lived with these highs and lows, the boom and bust, and um, we took advantage of it when we could, which includes the massive Spavinaw Water Project, which was the largest and most ambitious of its time. We're going to go back a little bit, 1924. And that basically was a project that brought fresh drinking water to Tulsa from over 60 miles away. So prior to this Spavinaw uh, water project, we were getting our water from the Arkansas River. So the Arkansas River, you know, people complain about it, but it is a prairie river. It is not a clean river. Now, the Arkansas originates in Colorado, in the Rocky Mountains. At that point, it is very clean. It is pure water. However, as it flows through... Eastern Colorado, 
Kansas, northern Oklahoma. It picks up a lot of sediment. It connects with the Cimarron River just upstream from uh, Lake Keystone. Cimarron is a very dirty, again, a prairie river. It comes from western Oklahoma, picking up all that red dirt along the way as it flows through the Stillwater area before meeting up with the Arkansas River. So getting water from the Arkansas was just not really good. The water would run brown in the bathtub. So we needed something. And fortunately, as you mentioned, just 60 miles east of here, we could tap into the Illinois River watershed. This is Ozark waters. This is clean, fresh water. And I think the most interesting part, other than the project itself, was the fact that the president, Calvin Coolidge, at the time pressed a, well, some people say turned a key, but he really pressed a telegraph key that would make the uh, whole project turn on from the White House. The impressive thing, or what I find most impressive about this system, is it is 60 or so miles that the water travels from Spavanaugh. It is downhill the whole way there are no pumps it is down in fact the um the project manager wr holloway put his last paycheck in the water up in spavanaugh where it floated down to what is now the mohawk reservoir where he collected his last paycheck and that's where uh, the zoo is located, of course, and, and that lake, which is named Lake Yehola today, actually pumps water to Reservoir Hill at the time, and uh, that was where the city was actually able to consume it. So, Another significant person in this project on that water board was our friend Cyrus Avery. We keep coming back to Cy Avery, whether we talk about the bridge that he built that is now Cyrus Avery, Avery Memorial Bridge right next to uh, Southwest Boulevard. He was the county commissioner when he had that belt. He was on the water board. He then went to the National Highway Commission, and he is the reason why we have Route 66 through Tulsa. I'm sure next month for our next episode, Reese Martin is going to want to talk a lot about Cy Avery, but he had a role in that Spavanaugh project as well. And there's a lot of uh, argument over who started Route 66. We'll have uh, Springfield uh, deal with that issue. <laughs> no, no, but but you'll hear more about that, like you said, coming up on the next episode. But um, you know, other things that were making Tulsa known were its music at the time. We had Bob Wills and his radio show that was broadcast across the country. Um, and so, you know, there's an upcoming documentary. And again, we're going to save that because we've already talked so much. But this is kind of the uh, other elephant in the room, the coal industry and mining. So one other industry before we call it quits here, often overlooked by the oil success the mining in Oklahoma was much larger than we often try to remember. And again, it started with the railroad and it was because it ran on coal. They, they mined the area as early as 1882 in the city of Dawson, which is near just west of the airport, was called Coal Bank initially and uh, was the largest coal deposit in Tulsa and helped the town um uh, in multiple ways, but that kind of mining that was happening up there was strip mining. Um, and in east of BA, there was also a large strip mine. Strip mines are basically above ground mining. And uh, south of Turkey Mountain, we had strip and underground mining. And that's where a lot of the interest uh, with the fairgrounds, underground mining comes into interest. But of course, other areas, you know, like we mentioned, Bird Creek. Uh, but in Tulsa County at the time, 16 coal mines, most active between 1920 and 1950. There was a uh, strip mine up by where I grew up, an uh, area called German Corner uh, in Tulsa County between Owasso and Tulsa, or between Owasso and Collinsville. And uh, yeah, we would actually swim in those old chat piles and those uh, my Yeah, I would not let my kids do it today. We didn't know any better back then, swimming in the old strip mines. 
we're lucky to still have you here for the Thank next. Thank you. I hopefully, next for that. the next episode. Maybe that's <laughs> what's wrong with me. I hadn't thought about that. But you know, <laughs> sue so, somebody. So there were strip pits, there were slope pits, and there were shaft mines, which. Strip means above ground. Slope means you're accessing the ground at an angle to get underground. And shaft means you're going vertically, completely down. So these shaft mines that were in the Midtown area happened between Lewis and Sheridan, between 31st Street South and 36th Street North. And I just took a tour of what they look like today and um, the Hoover area where strip mining once occurred. That's really the most noticeable area, but these underground mines that were elsewhere that kind of more people find interesting were, according to the city, at least 20 feet, but most think 60 to 100 feet underneath the fairgrounds area. But in White City near 11th and Yale, there were underground railways that shipped coal. And White City was a, um, a dairy farm at the time. But these tunnels ran underneath uh, White City until about 1930. And that's where the Franklin School is, which also begs the question, uh, a Route 66 question, is that underground tunnel that once existed by that school was it repurposed from the coal mines i mean i don't oh, know that answer interesting i yes yes i see what you're saying to move people across route 66 because it was a constant flow of traffic they did they did go underground to cross 11th and by the 1930s, that's when the mines would have left the White City. But the last mine in Tulsa area was actually uh, closer to 21st and Harvard. And that closed in 1955. So I lived for a time um, there off of 24th Street, uh, 24th and Louisville specifically. There are those Harvard apartments that are right there. Well, just east of those Harvard apartments is an area you can tell was once industrial. You can tell on, I forget which road, but one of the roads east of there, you can tell where there was a rail line that once went through that area towards what is now the Tulsa Fairgrounds. And uh, I saw someone mention that in the research process, and they said that initially um, the the BA Expressway had a stop sign on it for the railroad to come across, which I haven't been able to confirm <laughs> that. Is or, that right? Or if They're there was some kind of highway. Or yeah, so? yeah. So someone mentioned that, but you know how it goes with with Rumors, mentioning things. I mean, that's kind of legends. That's how we end up with other episodes that we're going to cover. Um, Let's talk about (laughs) Zeppelins landing atop the National Bank of Tulsa building. So not much evidence, um, despite people wanting it to be, that the fairgrounds were placed there due to mining. However, in 1931, there was a resident that demanded that the coal mining stop to avoid any further issues. And it was said that the mines, you know, after they had been closed, especially in that area, building plans and ground excavations were unfavorable. So, you know, Warren... Yeah, your house could collapse (laughs) into a hole, a mine that nobody knew was there. They weren't mapped back in those early days. We we really don't know where some of those mines are today. There may be large holes under your house. I think one of the interesting things um, is that William Warren or... Um, you know, of Warren wanted to build uh, the St. Francis Hospital initially at southeast corner of 21st and Yale where that neighborhood um, Walmart is but again the ground excavations just weren't, weren't favorable for that time but it's also said that one of the things that did get built the doctor's hospital near the Harvard intersection that you were talking about the, the uh, elevator smelled like coal after the completion of the building but other things were built in that area, as we know. Originally, the Highland uh, Park Golf Course, which once existed at 21st and Yale, later a Sears, and now an, a shopping center, um, just east of the fairgrounds, of course, and above, you know, numerous mines. And some of the things that have happened over the years in 1962, a 50-foot mine shaft just north of Archer and Yale was found. And then uh, 10 years later, a a collapsed roof during the excavation um, near the northwest corner of 21st and Sheridan. 
And then Big Splash by 1988 loses millions of gallons of water um, when their water leaks out and seeps into this mine. They didn't really know it until much later. And according to the Oklahoma Conservation Commission, who kind of, you know, looks after these things, there's been some subsidence, as they call it, which is basically a sinking of the land in a street and residential yard east of the fairgrounds in the late 90s, but that was repaired by the city. But the interesting thing about our state is that it has no subsidence insurance like other states. So if anything were to happen, um, you weren't paid initially for any kind of um, disorder, but in the early 2000s, you know, a homeowner south of the fairgrounds found one of the biggest holes near his driveway, which led to, uh, according to the the report, 10 by 10 foot mine shaft area. And um, yeah, like I said, over in the Hoover area is where we see that strip mining um, that's kind of still most reminiscent and, and still visible, plus the outcrop that's behind um, the good old Casa Bonita. But according to the city, um, a cave-in is still possible at any time. Um, these mines were very low, of course, not the big mines that we see in, in other places of the country. But homeowners are encouraged to fill in holes that open. And depending on the depth of the mine, uh, the mine you can find out uh, what its condition is by drilling. But again, there's no program and money in place to figure out these questions, which brings us to today. Be careful that your house does not sink into a hole. I think that a lot of these homes that are in the area will be will be okay. Um, but the interesting part is that the city is is watching this closely and and um, they're staying on top of it. Although there's no money, but you know they're still um, viewing it very closely. But you know our past. And geological past, our our past as individuals influence what modern Tulsa is today. So we still have, you know, these legacy wells that are producing small amounts of oil. Absolutely, yeah. That town. takes us back to uh, where we began. You know, some 250 million years ago in this story and those deposits within the Permian area that continue to have an effect on uh, Tulsa with both oil and natural gas. And, uh, you know, we still have odes to that uh, of our oil history with uh, teams like the drillers, the oilers, the roughnecks, which are no longer. But, of course, you know, that same kind of oil mentality that made the oil capital. And speaking of the oil capital and the district, again, the new YouTube video will be released um, shortly after the recording of this. Yeah, it's a uh, relatively short video because um, we just looked at the heart of uh, the oil capital of the world, 4th and Boston in Tulsa. And uh, yeah, just looked at each of the buildings on those four corners of that intersection. And um, the Council Oak, of course, you can still visit there. Um, and what's interesting with the tribal nations, 39 individual tribal nations, more Native American tribes than any other state. And, so, you know, the Council Oak Tree is, of course, in the Riverview neighborhood. John Riverview Beasley <laughs> with the Always got to get uh, in my Riverview reference. There. Um, but you were also going to talk about the other types of technology that are kind of against oil i guess renewable technology oh, there you which go. it doesn't the, have to be against it doesn't have to be. well you know our i think our energy future is going to be dependent on a variety of sources which for some time is going to include include fossil fuels of oil and natural gas you know uh, fortunately i think the days of coal are largely behind us we still have the pso plant out in um, uh, northeast of here in Ulaga that uh, is a coal-fired plant. But uh, we do see more and more renewable energy sources, certainly as you go further west, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain, wrote a song about it, Oklahoma. Um, but uh, yeah, more of the renewable resources. And 
Guthrie Green. So if you look at what's going on in the art district, and I look forward to seeing more of the electric vehicle charging stations, specifically there in the art district, you know, I saw that there are some set up out at Gathering Place, another George Kaiser project. Um, one of his, you know, earlier projects was the Guthrie Green, which uh, that dock has solar panels that provide power for all the lights there on the Guthrie Green as well as the geothermal vents. So you look at the Guthrie Green and it looks like it's a very simple lawn. How can this be an $8 million project? Well, first, it was a brownfield. There were old tanks. There was all kinds of nastiness under that surface that had to be removed. And then when they did that, they put in not only the solar panels, they put in those geothermal wells. So there are geothermal vents that help provide both heating and cooling for the buildings around the Guthrie Green, including the Woody Guthrie Center, the Bob Dylan Archives, the AHA Center, and an uh, interesting thing to note, if you go out right now, February, to Guthrie Green, that grass is green. You go out in July and August, the grass is green. Take off your shoes. Take a walk through the grass because it's nice and cool because those geothermal vents also regulate the temperature of that lawn. Yeah, and um, speaking of renewable energy, uh, we just had the su Super Bowl this past week, which we had five um, all-electric car commercials. And, you know, uh, what was it, two years or a year ago that we had Tulsa featured in a Super Bowl commercial for not an electric vehicle, but a vehicle. And, um, and then, you know, of course, a few years ago, we tried our hardest to get Tesla to move here by... Um, altering the driller's face we did you and i hung out there with driller <laughs> elon musk uh that was kind of an odd thing but it was cool to hang out there at the driller when all the teslas were coming by yeah well i mean and there's a, also a, a interesting story that just dropped um in the news talking about this period of time um so uh, be sure to check that out. But of course, we're moving forward and we have plenty more to tell. But I leave you with this question. If you could travel back to any time in Tulsa's history that we mentioned, when would that be? Because for me, it would probably be, you know, around the dinosaur time, try to hang out <laughs> with them. get a few photos. And Go all Jurassic World on it. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I would love to have been here with Washington Irving, you know, traveling in the 1820s, 1830s, and seeing what this area was like before, long before it was the Tulsa that we know today. So yeah, leave it in the comment section below when what time would you like to travel back to because this is, of course, time travel Tulsa. And if you like this podcast, give us a follow and like. That will do it for this extended edition of the Tulsa Times podcast. And of course, I'm your host, Patrick McNicholas, joined with John Riverview Beasley. And if you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, be sure to reach out either social media uh, Tulsa Past, Tulsa Past Gmail, and TulsaPast.com. Be sure to check out John's new video and be on the lookout for new episodes. I want to thank Jimmy, our audio engineer, and Patreon supporters, as well as everyone who has encouraged this venture thus far. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Tulsa Times podcast. <laughs>